Welcome to the Operators Association Podcast. I'm your host, William Branham, retired Navy SEAL, 26 years in the Navy. And uh, today we're going to talk about my third phase in BUDS. So for those of you who don't know, third phase is the third phase of training. So first phase is really the grinded out phase. It's where the infamous hell week is. And I think my next episode will be on my hell week. Um, I've covered uh, first phase. Second phase is the dive dive phase. And there's a little bit of a hell week in there as well. And then the third phase of training is, is land warfare. That's kind of where the, the rubber meets the road. That's where you feel like you're really just about to become a Navy SEAL. Uh, you know, there's this transition that happens in, uh, in BUDS where you go from from first phase where you're wearing greens and a, and a white t-shirt through hell week and after you graduate hell week then you uh put on a brown t-shirt and those are the 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 visual demarcations of success that you have in in seal training and then once you graduate first phase you change the color of your helmet from a green helmet to a blue helmet and you have to do all the work of of sanding it down and and painting it a new color and then um, and then when you go into third phase, you change uniforms completely. You take off the, the OD green uniform, uh, you take off the, gr- the blue helmet, and you paint your helmet red, and you put on camis. And then you also put on uh, like a load-bearing equipment, some sort of H gear. And uh, so you change your uniform, you change the equipment that you wear, you change the color of your helmet. So you're able to see these three uh, goals that you're these three mountains that you're climbing because you know the the color of the helmet is the start of the journey and then the changing of the helmet is again a start of the journey and so if you can go through your life and see those mountains in front of you in in everything that you do it doesn't matter if you're part of special operations or not but if you can go through the through your life and see those mountains in front of you and just be hungry to get to the top of each one of them. And if you can immerse yourself in that kind of thinking, then you will be unstoppable in everything that you do in your life. So as we start, uh, you know, the third phase of training, you're, you're close to graduation. You know, you have about six, seven weeks to go before graduation, maybe eight weeks. I don't remember. I don't exactly know what it is now, but, uh, you know, this is your journey. And I remember watching those guys as I was going through training, the guys in third phase that were wearing the camis and the red helmets, and the class was much smaller than than the other phases of training. And you know what? Those guys were the loudest. They were the most motivated. They were in the best shape of their entire life. And those were the people that we were aspiring to be, those guys in those red helmets. So now I'm in third phase. And the way that you get there is you graduate second phase, you do this, you know, sort of FTX, field training exercise dive. I remember ours was a disaster. We were terrible at it. I was not the the I was not the uh, the pilot. I was just the buddy dragging the buoy along. It wasn't that much fun. Uh, I hate being the buddy, but you know, you got to take your turn either driving or 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 riding or, you know, the, as the navigator or as the buddy, you know, pulling the buoy. And uh, so the transition from second phase to third phase is you you take your blue helmet and you sand that thing down and then you paint it red. Uh, you've already moved out of the barracks. Uh, but then, you know, you get new equipment, you get land warfare equipment, you and, and you wear that around now you um, you have a red helmet, you let me see, let me look at my notes here before I get too far down the road. So, you know, going back to second phase, you're you're focusing on diving and you're learning how to dive and you're learning how to dive this new rig, but really what you're what they're trying to see is if you are able to pay attention to detail, if you're able to follow very detailed instructions in very stressful situations, you know, like being underwater, holding your breath or you're completely out of breath after someone just kicked your ass and then you have to go through this problem solving uh, series and they want to see that you you're under stress and you're but you're able to solve these problems in a very detail oriented fashion following procedures to a T and for the most for a lot of ways that's a lot of what happens in third phase as well you know you start off there's not a lot of beat down sessions uh, while you're in third phase however there is plenty of opportunity to drop the hammer on you because you know 
you're still in training. You're still in buds. And uh, you're in really great shape, but they can still make your life incredibly miserable. And, uh, you know, your, your expectations are that you're going to perform at a higher level now. Your, your four-mile time run times get shorter. Uh, but you're also running faster. You're trying to beat your last time. Your O-course times get, uh, get shorter. Your two-mile ocean swims get shorter. Mine didn't get significantly shorter because I was, I was an okay swimmer and I took on uh, a buddy who was having a little bit of trouble swimming. He wasn't quite as good of a swimmer. So I took him under my wing to make sure that he passed all the swims. I didn't drag him along. I just basically did all the navigating and he just had to stay with me while we were swimming. Um, and if I got too far ahead of him, he would like grab my fin and pull me back because he was super pissed off about it. And that's, that's just the way it is. Uh, but, but third phase, you're focused on land warfare training. You still get back in the water and you're still going to have the opportunity to do some underwater breath holding and knot tying and things like that out on San Clemente Island. But for the most part, this is, this is, you know, because this is the, this is land warfare. This is where you feel like you're a Navy SEAL. Finally. You know, diving, I didn't feel like I was going to become a Navy SEAL. Uh, all the sexy stuff just seems to be on land. So that's where I wanted to be. But again, the thing that separates the SEAL teams from the rest of special operations is the ocean, is the water. We do it better than anyone else because it sucks. Um, so third phase, there's a lot of classroom. You don't think that it's going to be that way, but it's that way. You're in the classroom a lot. You're learning. Uh, you're learning time fuse calculations you're learning how to tie uh the proper knots for debt cord you're learning about electric blasting caps non-electric blasting caps different kinds of demo demo everything from tnt to petn to c2 c4 c6 all these different uh kind of demo demolition charges that are out there you're you're learning uh how to build demolition charges uh you're learning you know what's in a in a haversack what's in a what's an m112 block things like that, what it's ballistic, gosh, I don't even remember what it's called, the ballistic capabilities of each demo charge is, or what, you know, TNT is like, is a one, and then a C4 is a 1.4, and then there's all these different calculations to go into it, and you learn that in in the schoolhouse, in BUDS. Uh, then you'll go out onto the reach, onto the beach, and you will build a mock demo range. You'll have a and, and this is where they're looking for attention to detail. Are you going to follow instructions? You know, follow procedures like do not walk backwards on a demo field. And we're just talking about on the beach, but we're practicing procedures as if it were real. So they'll go over all these procedures for demo, how to cap in, how to tie a proper uh, a clove hitch or a right angle knot in, in a piece of debt cord. You know, uh, a, a neat knot is a happy knot because you don't want to have a sloppy knot that's going to break the 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 fire um what do they call it uh it's not going to break the um the explosive chain of of the debt cord because if you have a piece of demo that doesn't go off in real life you have to deal with it in a very special way and you don't know if that thing didn't go off just because the explosive train didn't get to it or if it went low order or if it's going to go off in like 10 minutes when you walk up to it so demo is a very touchy very specific uh very attention to detail uh art and and so they're looking for you to have extreme uh attention to detail while you're doing uh while you're practicing and learning demo learning how to you know calculate time fuse because you want that time fuse to go off within three seconds of when you want it to go off and the way that you calculate time fuse is you take a, a 12 or 24 inch piece of time fuse, you put a, an M60 fuse igniter on it, you strike it, and, and then you time how long it takes that 24 inches or that 12 inches of time fuse to burn out. And then you take that calculation, you figure out how long you want the time fuse to go, and then you cut the time fuse so that it goes off within three to five seconds of however long if you want it to be a five minute or a 10 minute time fuse it has to go off within three to five seconds of that 10 minutes or of that five minutes so you have to be very detailed and and right down to to the nat's ass in in calculation when you're when you're working on things like that uh so again they want to they want you to pay very particular attention to detail and do things 
uh, in that in that fashion. So one of the reasons that they want you they they're having you do these things that you're under a lot of stress and you're you're following very detailed instructions is they want to make sure that you're going to be a good fit when you get to the SEAL teams. Just because you have grit and grind and you can make it through Hell Week 17 times and you never get tired, that doesn't make you a good SEAL. Um, what they're doing when they're putting you into these scenarios, they're going back to the SEAL team when when they finish their time as instructors. And they want they want to have guys graduate training that they're going to trust and that they will be proud to serve with when they get back to the C to the SEAL teams. So BUDS is just, again, it's just a selection process. Yes, it's hard. Yes, you're you're putting out you know all your effort, but BUDS is a selection process. And you can be dropped from training, you know, all the way deep into third phase. And I'll tell you some stories about two guys, three guys actually, that were dropped from training um, in in the third phase. Two out on San Clemente Island and one uh, just before out going out to San Clemente Island. And so one of those guys, we'll call him Hutch. He was a Navy diver and he started, I think in class 206. He was hard, hard man. And he made it all the way through uh, first phase of 206, him and eight other guys finished first phase through hell week, through first phase. They're getting ready to go to second phase. And there was a review board and the review board said, all nine of you, we don't like the way that you perform. We don't think that you're performing at the caliber of, uh, of you know, the SEALs that we want to, to be to serve with on the SEAL teams. So if you want to be part of this, this organization, you have to go back to the first day of training and, and join class 207 and, uh, and go through first phase all over again. You don't have to do hell week, but you have to do all of first phase all over again. Oh, and by the way, uh, that in the entire time that you're in first phase, you have to show up and check in with us every hour on the hour, wet and sandy. And so Bud sucks enough as it is. To show up every hour on the hour and check in with the instructors wet and sandy is, is beyond miserable. So H Hutch was a hard man. He was a Navy diver. He was an E6. So they were already kind of gunning for him because he was so senior in the Navy. And if you're going to be a senior guy going through Bud's, you're going to show up to the SEAL teams as a senior guy. And you're going to be expected to perform as if you had been in the SEAL teams for many years and you've done multiple platoons and you have lots of experience. But if you show up as an E6 they are, they, and you don't know anything, you better be bringing something to the table. And so Hutch, he had been rolled back once because of performance in, in first phase and had to do all of first phase all over again. He went through second phase with no problem because he was a Navy diver. He was very comfortable underwater. But then in third phase, during some of the, the pistol shooting, I think maybe some of the repelling, and definitely I know I heard stories about during uh, this mock demo, uh, this demo period, he... He had it, a number of safety violations. I don't know if he walked backwards or tripped over the dead core, didn't watch where he was going. I don't know, uh, or just did, or just they just didn't like him. I don't really know, but I know that he was about one week from going to the island, going out to San Clemente Island, and they kicked him out of uh, kicked him out of training um, for for safety violations. And you know that's that's just the way it is. And and if you're not willing to accept that risk then you shouldn't try to to become a seal or uh, an SS, sf guy or or any other special operations there are other other things out there for you that that have uh less less consequence i guess so then we had another guy and he was in my boat crew during hell week and uh and i'll tell you kind of about my boat crew during hell week uh the, the next the next episode but he was this was his second time in buds he got hurt the first time and they sent him to the fleet this was his second time in buds we're on san clemente island we're running the o course it's a little bit of a different o course out there and there was a new master chief instructor that showed up to the island he was super motivated super nice guy funny and he thought he saw this guy cheat or skip an obstacle and so they called him aside and they're like hey man we saw you cheat i saw you cheat you're you didn't do this obstacle, go do it again. And he was a little bit argumentative. He said, I did the, I did the obstacle. And quite honestly, I believe that he did the obstacle. 
we had a bunch of Singaporeans in our in our buds class, uh, I think five, and they do not have to perform at the same standard that the rest of the guys who are becoming seals do. You know, they can quit or not finish evolutions, and it's fine. They're just going through the motions of being there because there's some. Uh, they're not ever going to be Navy SEALs. They're just going to go back to their to their units back in Singapore or in Korea or in Greece or wherever they're from and, you know, say that they went through SEAL training and now they're Navy SEALs, but they're really not. Um, so and they would they would cheat on everything. They were weak. They were cheating. They were whiners. And um, so but he did look kind of like one of those Singaporeans. And so because they thought he had a. Um, he had an integrity issue where he he skipped an obstacle and then he's lying about it and he's continuing to lie about it and not come clean they and they they didn't like his attitude i guess they kicked him out and i know that he's gone back for a third time i don't think he made it the third time so again if you're not willing to roll the bones like you may not make it through training you may do what you think everything is correct and get through you could still get kicked out for attitude or or some other reason so you have to be prepared for that so getting back to training so the first week we're you're doing a lot of demo stuff a lot of classroom stuff <clears throat> i think the second week you they start teaching you how to shoot and you start shooting a pistol you in the seal teams we we were using the the sig p226 i think we've transitioned over to a glock 19 now but you go to the range and they teach you basic marksmanship basic pistol marksmanship and and you shoot the navy qual you shoot you go all week you learn how to shoot and there are some guys who've never fired a gun before in their life and so this is amazing training for them um i was not a great shot before i went to, to went to buds and then one of my my swim buddy that i kind of took under my wing to help me um to help him you know pass the swims he used to be a firearms instructor he was a very good shot and so I asked him to take me to the range and teach me how to shoot before we actually got to the third phase. And, uh, and, and that certainly helped level me up and, and put me a little bit ahead of some other guys prior to, um, I, prior to us actually learning how to shoot in buds. And, and I mean, I'm a slow learner. I don't listen that well, but he was a good teacher. So he got me where I needed to be. Uh, so that I was able to shoot expert on, I, I could shoot a rifle fine. Shooting a pistol was a completely different animal to me, but the same points of performance. Once you really learn the points of performance of shooting, uh, you can shoot anything. I can shoot anything now because I know the, the proper points of performance on shooting. And maybe I'll do an episode on that one day. Um, but anyway, so during that second week, you even though you go to the range pretty much all day, you're still doing different events you're either doing the o course a two mile ocean swim uh you're doing a four mile timed run you're doing conditioning runs you're doing you know uh we you know calisthenic pts um and so i don't remember what day maybe tuesday or wednesday we we went to the range in the morning we came back probably around 3 p.m and we're running the o course and we had a big class and so we're running the o i was pretty fast on the o course i wouldn't call myself fast but i was i was in the top 10 top 12 i think on the o course in in the class and we had like 45 people and so i went and i did my o course and i ran to the demo pits and came back and i'm sitting there in my spot stretching out uh you know waiting watching the other guys run the o course and let me tell you something you do not want to be just sort of sitting around not doing anything while other people are doing something in buds you third phase is is kind of okay but there's still this level of fear like oh my god i'm gonna get in trouble i better watch out what i do so uh but anyway i'm just sitting there i'm stretching out i'm kind of watching the other guys i'm staying busy if they see you like screwing around with the sand and not like trying to better yourself in some way they're gonna come and mess with you but i'm like oh stretch out i need to stretch out anyway and uh and i see one of the guys in the class and i see him and he starts the o course and he looks like shit I'm like, dude, he looks terrible. And I don't know if it was, you know, how he was moving or there was something in his face. I don't exactly remember, but I just remember thinking like, dude, you look like shit. And he like barely gets over the first obstacle. And I just go back to stretching and kind of like not looking around because you don't want to get in trouble. Like you're still afraid of like, I don't, I, I don't want to go back and get wet and sandy. I can do it. I just don't want to do it. And then I'm stretching some more. And then I don't know what caught my eye, what made me look up. The, the, the slide for life, which is about a, 
uh, about a four-story tower, and it's a, about a 100-foot rope that goes from the top of that tower all the way to about six feet off the ground. And it's about 100 feet. It's a nice angle. And in first phase and second phase, you get on that thing, and you, you're, you're hanging under the rope, and you kind of go hand over hand as you slide down the rope, and your feet are crossed at the bottom, uh, you know, holding you onto the rope, hands and feet, and you slide down. Well, in third phase, they let you get on top of the rope commando style. It's very sexy. It looks very cool. It's very efficient. So basically, it's kind of scary too, though. You know, getting up there and balancing on top of this two-inch round rope and then pulling yourself down the rope. But uh, so the way you get on the rope is you, you grab the rope, you throw your leg over it, and you, you hook the top of your foot uh, between like your like kind of where your ankle is and your your shin bone you kind of hook that the top of your 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 boot your your foot on the top of the rope you hang your knee down on one side and you hang your other leg down on the other side and you make sure you get that rope you know between your legs properly so you're not catching any any important parts to get rope burn on your important parts and you kind of set your if you're smart you kind of get your belt buckle directly on the rope and you kind of like chest up and you pull yourself down the rope hand over hand and you use your foot to propel yourself forward also. It's very fast, it's very efficient. You're not burning your hands out on the rope. Uh, and if you keep your chest up, you're not, um, you're not getting like rope burned down your chest. Like there's a lot of things that can go wrong. But anyway, I looked up and just about that time, I saw someone like peel off the top, the rope at the top level of the slide for life we're, he's four stories up and he lawn darted into the sand and i was like oh my god i wonder if that was mcbee the guy who looked like shit like just like seven or ten minutes ago because it takes about i think about 12 or 15 minutes to do the of course i don't remember when you're when you're good at it i think you can do it pretty quickly but uh, and it and so like instructors just swarm on him um and he was fine like i like i didn't really have much of a question about who it was peeling off the rope because I saw how he looked when he took off. And so that should kind of be a lesson to you. Like you can see when something's not right with people. And if they're a little bit messed up, maybe that's not a bad time to kind of intervene and, and maybe help him out. But don't worry, McBee lived. He graduated with this. And then he went on to, uh, he retired. He's a retired senior chief seal also. But he's done something that's pretty cool. And if you guys are listening to this, I'd, like, I'd love for you to go and check out uh, Uncommon Grit. It is a book um, that it's just a picture book, really. It's a great coffee table book, and it's it's pictures of of seal training of buds, and it's like some of the most amazing pictures that you will ever see. And if you follow him, McTeams on Instagram, you'll see a lot of his pictures. But uh, I have his book. It's actually sitting right here on my desk. And uh, and so what the Navy did is they he had a heart attack. He had, he had to get a pacemaker at some point. And, um, and the Navy said, Hey, you're really good, uh, a good photographer. Cause he just wanted to learn photography because he's kind of a Renaissance man. There's all kinds of guys in the SEAL teams. And, uh, and so he just went around and he was like, that was his job in the, in the teams was to just take pictures of buds for like a year. And then the Navy let him keep all of the pictures that he took. And he's taken that and he's turned it into this amazing book called Uncommon Grit. I know I'm getting off the subject of third phase, but McBee lawn darted. And so he freaking earned uh, a little bit of a shout out here. Uh, and he lived. So if you guys wouldn't mind, go go check out Uncommon Grit and maybe pick yourself up a book. I don't get anything out of it. I'm just helping out a teammate. And, uh, and it's a badass book. I paid full price for it my very own self. Um, But kind of going back to the the slide for life, there was, you know, it's it's a dangerous obstacle. Bud's training is dangerous. Now there was the there's a 50 foot cargo net out there, and there was an ROTC girl that fell off of it at some point and died. So people have died on the O course. I uh, you shouldn't go and be scared of that. You know, just you know, you can be certainly injured. It's high risk training. Um, but at some point, Bud's put a net underneath the that that four story. Uh, tower and that's 100 feet of rope uh, because maybe some other people fell off I don't really know uh, and they left that net up there for for a few years and then one day they took it back down and I think the reason that they took it down is they had more guys fall off the slide for life because they knew they had that net under them to catch them uh, than when they didn't have that net so you know the guys that fell it was because 
with no net, it was because they were either not in good shape, like something was just medically wrong with them, or their hands just gave out. And I nearly had that happen to me the first time, one or two times I did it until I learned proper technique. Um, those are really the only two reasons or someone was just screwing around that shouldn't have been out there on the O course and, and they fell. But I think they had so many people like students like, oh, it's OK if I fall or, you know, random people like screw around and fall into the net because they knew that that net would catch them. And that's something that happens to us in life. We, if we can go through life and we feel that we have this safety net under us, that it, if we fall off the rope, no big deal, we're going to be caught. Um, but when we remove that net, there's not a whole lot of things that's going to make my hands let go of that rope. I'm going to follow that rope all the way to the ground. So I think that's something, if we're able to incorporate that mentality into our life, into our training, into everything that we do, we'll be better people for it. We'll have, you know, we, if we live a life with, of consequence, if we live our life where, you know, failure, failure is an option, but it's going to hurt a lot. And so those lessons that we learn through that failure are, are critical. And so we will try our best not to fail, not to fall, because we don't have that net under us. Um, so I think the lesson there is, is if we have a safety net in our life all the time, then we're not going to work as hard as we would if we didn't have that net to catch us. So if, if you don't have a net, if you have greater consequences, then you're not going to let go of that rope no matter what. So I, I think that's really the, the biggest lesson there. So the next week we learned how to repel uh, down the face of a 50 foot tower. You know, we learned knots. We learned how to, you know, kind of repel down, uh, down the face of a tower, which is kind of scary. We also learned how to repel through a hell hole, which is just like, you know, you have the tower and then you have a hole in it. And, you know, there's helicopters, different, different air platforms. You know, you, you, maybe you can't go out the side door or you can't go out the, the ramp. They just have a hole in the bottom that they open up. Uh, a door in the bottom of the of the helo and you have to like repel through that thing and that's a little bit weirder than than going down the side of a mountain and if you're gonna you know people have asked me should i learn how to scuba dive or anything like that before i go to buds and i would say i wouldn't waste my time or my money but you know if you could go and learn how to repel and kind of get comfortable doing that a few times a few 10 15 times uh it'll be easier than doing it for the first time in training where you're like perform right now i know you're scared just go uh so the, that I, I would recommend doing something like that. Um, but once you get to the SEAL teams, you'll have opportunities to go become qualified as a fast rope master, as a rappel master, as a as a as a HRST master, uh, and basically you'll be the guy. You can be a super junior guy and be in charge of of whether when guys like controlling the helicopter, telling guys when to go, you know, deciding like landing zones. Uh, and things like that. So it's it's a very cool qualification and job uh, that you'll get to do, and you'll get to do it a lot more, a lot more uh, repelling and fast roping when you get to the team. So that's one of those one of those sexy things that's that's a lot of fun to do. So then you're off to San Clemente Island. We're going to spend the uh, the last really four weeks, four out of five weeks uh, before you for graduation, and and it's a little bit different now. When I went through. Uh, after third phase, you graduated, then you went to your SEAL team, or you went to jump school and then to your SEAL team, and then we did STT back then. Now it's a pipeline where you finish third phase and then you roll into STT, uh, which is, you know, you go to jump school, uh, you do, you learn how to, to static line, you learn how to free fall, then you go up to Kodiak, Alaska, you learn how to do some land navigation out in the, in the wilderness, you learn some wilderness survival, maybe some cold weather training, and then you do some diving, you do some land warfare, and uh, it's a really great block of training. Then you graduate and you get your trident. We didn't, it wasn't like that back in the day, but uh, that's the way it is now. There's pros and cons to it, but you know, you, you take what you get. Uh, but anyway, you're, so you spend, you know, the last four weeks before you you're off to to San Clemente Island. And um, this is really the first military kind of deployment that you do. It's it's a month long deployment, more or less, because you're out there uh, alone and unafraid. You're there's no place to go. You don't have you live on the seal compound out there. There are no, there's no civilization that you're able to interact with at all in any way, shape or form. Uh, you're just there. 
and you're gonna learn and you're gonna do missions and you're gonna you know have the crap scared out of you and uh but you're gonna learn and uh and again there's plenty of time for to to, to be punished while you're out there if you if you screw it up so as you get ready to go to san clemente this will be the first time that most people will will build a military style pallet and it's just uh i forget the dimensions it's like a six by six a eight by eight maybe uh uh um, steel pallet, aluminum pallet, and then you build boxes around it and you can build it up to 108 inches tall uh, with all the equipment. And it needs to be, you know, as square and as neat as possible. And then you put cargo nets on it. And this is some of the most unsexy work that you'll do in special operations or in the military period if you decide to go that route. And, uh, and if you put uh, sensitive equipment on it, like communications equipment, uh, crypto, computers, or weapons, then you have to put a watch on that pallet until you get to your final destination. And, you know, that's one of the, another unsexy thing about being in the military or in the, in special operations is you don't have people to stand around and watch stuff for you. You got to watch your own stuff. So you have to set up a watch bill. And until that pallet gets to its final destination, you escort it to the airport from the airport to the compound. Uh, then you, un, then you break the, then you break the pallet down put the weapons and communications into secure storage, then you don't have to watch them anymore uh, because you're in a secure location, a secure compound and, and everything is uh, as it should be. Um, so you arrive San Clemente Island and this is your home for the next four weeks. Uh, it seems like a lot longer than that. So you go from the compound out there, you go from living in two man rooms with a shared bathroom with you know two other guys to living in more open bay barracks and and this is where you're you're starting to work as a squad and so again we had about 45 people i think in our class and uh so we broke broke it down into i think 11 people per squad and uh so you had a squad leader which is a senior guy and then you had like a a, a, a point man and a radio guy and everyone else just sort of did what they were told uh in the in the, in the squad but but so we got to san clemente we unpacked our stuff we kind of got settled then we went to the classroom this was pretty late in the day now a little bit dusk and uh and they put on a movie for us to watch and it was an hour of shark week talking about great whites and shark attacks and all this other stuff and you know how sharks are hunters and predators of the ocean and all this other stuff and uh, at the end of, and oh, and by the way, San Clemente Island is the third largest breeding ground in the world for great white sharks. And there's all sorts of sea lions, like you can hear them just barking all about all day and all night, like just a couple hundred yards away. So lots of food for sharks to eat. And, uh, and so as soon as Shark Week video is over, they brief us on, a, on our, our first swim and we're going and getting in the water and it's about midnight at this point and we get in the water and none of us we're all thinking like oh my god this is not cool <laughs> not one of us wanted to go on this swim uh and plus we had chem lights on there you know for safety so that you know if we drowned or something happens the instructors can find us uh or if we're eaten by a shark they can find the rest of our body you know stuff like that and uh and so we're out there we're all dressed up in our wetsuits fins knife udt life jacket we're ready to go but we're not ready to go we're just waiting for someone to say haha april fools or just kidding or whatever uh not a single one of us wanted to actually get in the ocean especially at night which is when sharks do their hunting uh after watching that video for sure there was also a lot of bioluminescence in the water so while we were swimming you know the water kind of glows around your body your hands and your face as you're like breathing and coming out of the water so as you disturb that bioluminescence it lights up the good and bad part about that it's kind of like surreal it's kind of like you're like fairy dust around it, it's it's very surreal swimming in in something like that but also there are other creatures out there in the water swimming around and so i believe there were some sea lions that were kind of shooting in and out kind of swimming around us under the water because you could see like these comet trails of like glowing whatever uh just sort of scooting all around swimming back and forth and up and down and for sure this was the fastest 
swim any one of us had done the entire time we were in buds. Not one of us wanted to waste any time screwing around in the water. If you were in my way, I'm climbing over you and I'm pulling you behind me because I'm going to hurry up and get done with this swim and get the F out of the water because uh, I was scared. So the next day we started learning marksmanship with the rifle, with a with an M16 or an M4. Uh, we, you learn how to clear malfunctions. You learn how to effectively clear and safe your weapon, safe weapons handling, which is the most critical part. And then from there, you go into actual marksmanship, uh, seven points of performance. You shoot the Navy qual. You learn how to be safe and accurate with your with your rifle. And really, your rifle becomes it becomes a part of you from pretty much that point on. And uh, but really, when you're when you're doing stuff like this the most important part more important than shooting uh high on on the navy qual or anything else is being safe you know as you're working through your your points of performance as you're working through your your magazine changes your tactical magazine changes as you're working through like tap rack bang through like clearing malfunctions always have your gun pointed in a safe direction always know what's in front of you never ever sweep your buddy like safety is the most important thing by far because if you have too many safety violations if you blatantly point your gun at someone else they will kick you out of buds immediately they will not mess around with it now safety things happen you know maybe sometimes you turn the wrong way or you like you're just learning how to use the gun you're not putting on safe when you're done firing you know you'll get safety violations and you'll pay for that later uh, it's paperwork. They're making a paper trail. So if you continue to make safety violations, then they, they have a reason to kick you out. But um, the most important thing, when you are on the range 100% of the time, is safety, safety, safety. And this is also the time where you really start picking up the idea that slow is smooth and smooth is fast. If you can safely, slowly tap, rack, bang, or clear your magazine, always keeping your weapon pointed in the safe direction, never sweeping anyone, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. That's where, and then you, the more you practice it, the more you practice those fine motor skills, those fine motor movements, you'll just naturally become faster. So you don't need to hurry up and, and be the fastest guy out there. If you have solid, slow fundamentals, you will become faster just by practice just by repetition so don't worry about being fast worry about being slow and smooth and smooth is fast and safe and safe and safe I don't know if I've said safe enough but be safe so you're out there on the island you're now you're basically on deployment and the instructors are also pretty much on deployment sometimes they'll switch out but uh, you might have an instructor that's been super cool the whole time and then you know he's been on the island for three weeks he's kind of fed up with the students messing up he goes from like the cool instructor to the dickhead instructor and you don't want that to happen because he's not allowed to leave the island maybe he's the proctor maybe he's the guy that's in charge of the class and uh you want to make sure that the instructors uh are happy uh and you're not pissing them off by screwing up or doing stupid things so because again you're still in buds and you're all on deployment and for the next four weeks even though that doesn't sound like a long time things get on your nerve because there are no days off. You're there 24 seven uh, and you're working the whole time. Now there's a galley on the island. So they bring in cooks and they cook for you three meals a day. And uh, it's great when you get to eat dry. So depending on the day, you have to earn your chow. You have to earn uh, eating dry. If you don't perform, then you have to eat wet outside and I was there during November December time frame it gets kind of chilly toward in in the evening so um, the way that you either you earn your chow starting off is you have to do I don't remember how many pull-ups you had to do with all of your H gear on full canteens so you had to do like 15 or 20 pull-ups uh, in a row without stopping and then a, a rope climb and then everyone does it and if you can't get that many pull-ups out then you have to go hit the ocean and get wet and then someone will bring your food out to you and you sit at a little metal table outside uh, a little bit humiliating it kind of sucks but it, it is what it is um the other way that you earn your chow is by running up frog hill 
And Frog Hill was a turning point for me, kind of really in my mental state of putting out, learning how to put out, learning that I had more gas in the tank than I thought I did. Frog Hill is a, it's a, it's a short run. It only takes you about a minute and a half to do it, maybe two minutes. And you have a certain amount of time to do it. I think maybe you have two minutes for everyone to get to the top of Frog Hill. So the terrain starts off, you know, it's a, it's a slight incline and then it goes off road and you kind of go down and then you start going up and you have to do switchbacks. It's so, such a steep hill. You kind of do these switchbacks to get to the top and the switchbacks are they're only wide enough for one person so if you get stuck behind someone you can't pass them and conversely if you're in front of someone and you slow down you're slowing down the entire train of guys behind you so i learned pretty quickly that i wanted to be as close to the front as i possibly could because i didn't want to put my fate of me going and getting wet and eating outside in someone else's hands so so I worked very hard to get to the front of the train, to get as close to the front, top six, seven guys. And, you know, I would feel sorry for myself. I'm like, you know, running up the hill. I'm I'm ahead of a lot of most of the class. And then I'm like, you know, my like, gosh, this is hard, man. This is steep. I'm out of breath already. I So much further. I kind of want to stop and like take a breath before I keep going. And if I did that, and guys did that, and they screwed everyone behind them. If I did that, I would have screwed the guy behind me. So anytime I thought that, and I would hear or kind of look over my shoulder to see how far that guy was behind me, and I would see him, and I'm like, well, I can't screw him. So, you know, I had to do something that was bigger than myself. I had to put out, you know, me putting out a little more effort was not only good for me and me making it there on time, but it also... I wasn't going to be the reason that someone else failed or didn't make it to the top of the hill because, you know, someone else didn't put out. So I wasn't, I wasn't going to let, you know, my, my feeling sorry for myself stop someone else from making it to the top of the hill in time. And that was, that helped me change a little bit of the mindset that I had about, you know, I'm tired, but I can keep going. And, and I think that's a critical skill in pretty much anything that you do in your life. Anytime you get tired and you think you can't go anymore, you always have a little more gas in the tank. It doesn't matter if you're on a run or a swim or you're you know working out or you're working on a project or you're writing a report or whatever it is. You, once you get to a point where you're like, I can't go anymore and you start feeling sorry for yourself, you have more in the tank. You have plenty more to get the job done. And it's just what mental state are you in in order to get you across that finish line? So I think the second week of training we started after we learned, you know, proper marksmanship with a with an M4 or an M16. I don't remember which weapon we had. Maybe it was either one. Uh, then we learned how to do contact drills. And basically, this is a mock gunfight. This is where you learn to shoot move and communicate there's a lot of stuff going on there's a lot of moving parts and i think this is the most dreaded and dangerous part of being an instructor uh because you're responsible for one of the students shooting one of the other students or shooting you by accident or or something like that so again i'm going to go back and i'm going to stress safety this is slow as smooth smooth as fast and you'll practice you know two maneuver elements communicating with one another maneuvering to meet a common goal, moving back, moving forward, moving left or moving right, you know, peeling or moving as a big unit. And it depends on what the scenario gives you in what call or what movement, tactical movement you do. But this is really where, you know, again, this is one of the more dangerous things that you do uh, in special operations is this, this shoot, move and communicate because there is so much going on and I can probably do an entire episode just on, and I like to call it the, the way you, to multitask like a Navy SEAL. And the bottom line is there is no such thing as multitask. Even when you're shoot, move and communicate, you can only do one of those tasks at a time. You can shoot, you can stop shooting, and then you communicate and then you can shoot again or, and then you can stop shooting and then you can get up and you can move and then you can communicate and then you can stop and then you can shoot again. So that's really the way the whole thing works. And you have to figure out what everyone else is doing and you're communicating back and forth and make sure you don't shoot your buddy. Cause we have had that happen in the SEAL teams where um, guys were, they lost their situational awareness. 
they fired shots and they actually hit their hit their buddy so it happens it's incredibly dangerous one of the most dangerous things that we do in training uh but again that's what makes us the best in in special operations is that we do hard things and we train for worst case scenario and uh and 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 buds or the q course or whatever the marsat guys do they this is the foundation and to do the really hard and dangerous things that turn into really sexy looking things but people don't see the work that goes into those hard and dangerous things and the safety that's involved in it and that slow is smooth and smooth is fast so again during all of this you know you'll do all these contact drills with no rounds in the in the in in your guns at all like no bullets will be seen and you'll just practice you'll say bang 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 a lot and that's okay you're that's your 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 shooting bang 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 you can't communicate when you're shooting bang 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 okay hey mo peel right bang 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 okay now you get up and you move and so you and you're running through these fundamentals so you have to pay attention to detail you have to pay attention to what you're doing what direction your weapon is pointing inevitably guys will make mistakes they will get safety violations if they're not too serious they get to stay in training if they're just egregious they leave training uh but for those safe those minor safety violations that you make you will have to pay for them and one of the ways that you pay for your safety violations is remember frog hill it's it's a super steep hill it really sucks to run up well for your safety violations you have to do flights up up frog hill and so they have these big steel pallets everyone knows what the what the wooden ones are that are around grocery stores and home depot and things like that but they also have these steel ones and they weigh a lot more than the wooden ones and you put with them on your back you mount it on your back you're kind of hunched over as you uh mount it on your back like it's a set of wings and you'll hold your arms out to your side to hold the 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 pallet on your back and you run up frog hill and you know the instructors will have some fun with that and they'll say okay uh you, and you have to ask permission to land in order to put the pallet down when you come back from frog hill and they may say negative ghost rider uh make another pass and then you have to run up frog hill again or they'll say uh your your tail is on fire bail out and hit the water and so you have to then you throw the pallet off your back you then you run down to the ocean and you get wet to put the fire out so you're gonna pay if you if you have safety violations you're gonna pay for it uh if they're not egregious uh you know it'll just be some sweat and pain and the instructors will have a little bit of fun with it and so it's all good that way so in addition to shoot move and communicate uh you know doing that that very dynamic movement uh with weapons you also learn how to blow stuff up you learn how to use demo so you we were practicing fake demo uh with like i don't know two by fours or whatever when we were back on in in california on the beach with our our, our mock demo range uh now we're we're out where we can actually blow stuff up and you know there there's a final uh demo ftx where you tie haversacks onto obstacles that are uh, approximately 25 feet underwater and uh, this is a time where you get to practice your breath holds again while doing very uh, meticulous work underwater and you have to be um as as tactical and certainly don't screw your buddy because you have micro lungs i had micro lungs and i tried very hard not to screw my buddy well, when I was doing this evolution. I don't know if I did a good job at it, but I, I, I'm I, sure that I could have done better. So again, you go back and you learn how to, uh, you, how to you're actually tying real debt cord this, at, now, you're building real charges, you're blowing up real uh, Claymore mines, you're throwing real hand grenades. And, and again, this is, you know, these are times where the instructors are, they're certainly, they earn their money during these evolutions you know i remember a story where a student like pulled the pin on a grenade and then the grenade slipped out of his hand and fell into the the bunker that he and the instructor were in and the instructor was like i mean he saved their lives he saw it happen and he grabbed the student and he threw the student out of the the bunker and then got out just before the the grenade went off well needless to say that student uh he, he didn't stick around. He left the island that very night. 
Um, so that again, that's a, that's an example of where it doesn't matter that you've made it through Hell Week, that you've made it through Pool Comp, that you've made it almost. You're only like a few weeks from graduating SEAL training. And uh, I'll give you another example of a guy who who left San Clemente Island before graduating. And he was a guy, I think I've talked about him in, in, in other episodes, where we were doing the, you know, this underwater knot tying, tying haversacks, like real demo charges, like 25 pounds of, of C4 onto these obstacles underwater. And it's very ar a very archaic way of doing it with hooks and ropes and things like that, but it gets the job done. So anyway, you, you swim down, you hold your breath, you, you know, maybe you swim the rope around the obstacle and hook it. And then your buddy comes down and he does another thing. And then you, you go down and you do a, another thing. And it's like you're taking turns going up and down. And while you're at the surface, you're watching your buddy to make sure he's okay at the bottom underwater. And this one kid, he had a hard time. Uh, he was a great guy. He would have been a great seal. Uh, everyone liked him, great personality. He was tactically sound, uh, but he had a problem where almost every time he held his breath underwater, he passed out. And that becomes a liability because, you know, he can do 99% of everything better than everyone else. But that 1%, that 1% thing that he cannot do, which is not pass out when he holds his breath underwater, makes him a liability. He was a great guy. He would have been a great seal, except he was a liability because he couldn't do that 1%. And it sucked, it sucked to see him go, it really sucked for him, but that's reality. And again, if you're not willing to um, accept that risk, then you shouldn't apply for these programs because there may be something medically that is gonna be, is gonna be too hard for you, that your body just isn't going to allow you to do that. So, so just keep that in mind as you, as you go to these programs because your body could fail you and you still have the obligation to, to the military that you, that you signed up for, even if you don't get to uh, finish the, the training that you signed up for. So that was two guys. That was the second guy in my class. So two guys in my class made it to third phase and two guys were kicked off the island and out of training all the way, like they were three weeks from graduation. I think both of them when they were both kicked off, uh, off the island and, and out of training. So it doesn't matter how far you make it, uh, you can always uh, leave training. And I know I've heard of other guys like making it to the end, but they had a bad attitude and like they, they were told, okay, do it again. And then they made it to the end again. And they're like, yeah, we don't actually like you. So we're going to kick you out of training. Um, so your expectation for performance in third phase is even higher than it has been through the whole rest of training. So first phase, they break you down. Second phase, they start building you up. You know, we do that two mile ocean swim. I'm sorry, the seven mile ocean swim, 5.5 uh, nautical miles. Uh, and then in third phase, you do a 14 mile run at about a seven and a half minute pace. Uh, you still do more ocean swims, you run more obstacle courses, and then you also do a, a 10 mile off-road run uh, with a 25 pound rucksack. That, uh, I remember that run and uh, I did very well up until about the last half mile where my body was just like, oh, you're dehydrated and you, uh, uh, we're just gonna start shutting down on you. So that, it's, it's hard, make sure you hydrate. Hydrate and get plenty of electrolytes. Um, same for the, the 14 mile run. It was about, about a half mile left and uh, my body just started cramping up and I pushed through it, but I did not feel that well for the last uh, probably half mile. Um, so the last couple of weeks you start doing a lot more mission planning. You start doing little tiny missions where anything from you know swimming across the beach, paddling a Zodiac around a part of San Clemente Island and then you know, bringing the Zodiac across the beach, hiding it, go doing a little mission, coming back, putting the Zodiac back in the water, paddling back around that part of the island and, and coming back. Um, and so one day uh, before we started that, we, we did a little over the beach appreciation class. And anytime in your military career or probably any of your career, if anyone says this is gonna be uh, a something something appreciation, you know that it's gonna suck. 
and uh, basically anything that says labeled appreciation is going to suck because what they want you to understand is that um, you can do it the hard way or you can do it the way that we're telling you to do it. And so the mission was to start at like four o'clock in the morning, get in the ocean at this point over here with your rucksacks, uh, you waterproofed everything, you had your weapons and your fins, your UDT life jacket, and they wanted you to swim. And we had a big class, uh, pretty much single file-ish, maybe in swim pairs, uh, about a half mile. And the, the way they wanted us to swim, it had us swimming through this giant kelp bed. And uh, again, thinking about Shark Week videos and hunting at night, because we are doing all this stuff at night, it was terrible. Uh, and, and things are, uh, and you know, critters would come up and like bump you. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to die in the kelp bed or kelp would kind of get wrapped around your, your fins or your legs as you're trying to swim by with your weapon on top of your rucksack that's just barely floating out of the water and you're learning these tactical lessons about being low in the water so that someone can't see you from land and i feel like something's going to eat me from below or the kelp is going to like grab me and pull me underwater uh so that was a terrible experience as well so the two things one you're you're swimming through a kelp bed in the middle of the night is uh terrible and terrifying and two uh, the other appreciation piece is is about your weapon. So anytime metal and salt water interact with one another, uh, you're going to get corrosion. So the second part of that is, you know, we, we finished that terrible experience swimming through the kelp bed in the middle of the night where I thought like things are like hitting me or attacking me or grabbing me and uh, going to pull me underwater or my buddy like bumped me or he maybe grabbed my fin just to mess with me. And <laughs> And of course I would do that to the guy in front of me because it was fun and uh, it made me being scared less scared um, because watching him freak out uh, and you're trying to be tactical and quiet. So anyway, um, so we finished that, that swim and before we can have breakfast, we have to go clean all our gear. And the first thing you do is you, you clean team gear, then personal gear, then you clean yourself. So we're all wet uh, and we go, we put our rucksacks away then we go to the armory and we clean our guns so we clean all the salt water off of them we take them down we break them down to parade rest we lubricate everything because we don't want corrosion to happen uh then we put our guns away then we we go get our udt life jacket we you know we clean that up we clean the the salt water off after every swim you do this clean the salt water out you lubricate it up you make sure that the co2 cartridge unscrews and screws back in you make sure that the actuator works so that if you do need to use that thing to save your life it will work and then you can go dry off because you're doing all this in wet clothing and again the way that that uh the sort of the saying goes in the seal teams is the way that you take care of your gear is you you take care of team gear personal gear and then you take care of yourself then you can finally go you know shower off and clean up and and kind of get ready to go but the the moral of the story here is is you if you take care of your gear your gear will take care of you if you don't take care of your gear the time that you're going to need it you're going to need it to save your life it's not going to work for you so take care of your gear and your gear will take care of you so we're in the last probably week and a half we're doing mission planning we're doing a mission execution on the island and uh we're divided up into squads and and i remember this one mission that we did we were never ever allowed to cross the airfield the airfield was just above the compound that we stayed at and we always had to you know walk around it to hit our target navigate to our target and then walk around it it was a long way it was like an hour to get around it and then to get back to to you know clean weapons and and debrief and and go to bed well one night we're walking back from a target and I'm not saying that we walked across the airfield because to date, I don't think anyone has ever admitted to walking across the airfield. But what I will tell you is that we got back about an hour before we were scheduled to get back. And uh, we probably would not have gotten caught, but one of the instructors just happened to walk through the, he like left something in the armory and he walks back to grab his coffee cup or whatever it was, I don't remember. 
And he was like, what are you guys doing here? You're here too early. You crossed the airfield, didn't you? And no one admitted to crossing the airfield. Uh, they interrogated us for many, 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 many hours. No one ever admitted that we crossed the airfield. However, for the next two days, we had to show up, the whole squad, to the instructors. We had to be wet every hour on the hour. And even during the downtime, we would like spend that time to kind of like dry out a little bit, just in time to go get wet again. And of course, we were sitting outside uh, of the galley, even though we passed Frog Hill and did our push-ups or our pull-ups or whatever, uh, to eat wet, because that's because you can't go in the galley um, unless you're dry. So, you know, they did good cop, bad cop. No one broke down. No one said that we, we crossed the airfield uh, because no one crossed the airfield. We just walked very quickly around the airfield and made it in, uh, in record time. So the final FTX, FTX, the demo FTX was we, we swam a, a, a law, like a roll of debt cord out into, into the bay there in front of the compound. Uh, and then we tied in all of the obstacles, all the haversacks that were underwater into this line of debt cord. We made this, it's called a trunk line. Uh, we did two of them uh, while other guys cut time fuse and uh, for, a, for a 10 minute uh, uh, time fuse in order to give guys enough time to include instructors, enough time to get out of the water and get back on land to a safe location and again, you had to cut time fuse to be plus or minus three to five seconds. Uh, so it could go off five seconds early or five seconds late uh, outside of that 10 minutes. And so I think whoever cut the time fuse was a little bit off. I think they were a little bit early, but um, maybe it was like 15 seconds or 30 seconds early. Uh, you know, plus or five seconds is hard to do for that much time fuse because it's not an exact science. Uh, but anyway, we ran a trunk line, we blew this giant uh, water shot. You know, it was like, I don't know, a couple hundred pounds of, of C4 uh, under the water. And it's this just giant, like um, huge explosion and just like water everywhere. It was very, very, very cool uh, to see. And uh, maybe that's why we never got eaten by any sharks because we blow things up down there often enough and it, and it keeps them away. Uh, so after, after training, we pack up, you fly back to San Diego. Uh, you move back into your room for that last week, getting ready for graduation. I remember two, actually three PT events uh, that we had uh, that last week. It was mostly an admin week, but you hadn't graduated yet. So you still had to perform as a student, show up on time in formation and all the things that you're supposed to do. Uh, but we were turning gear in and things like that. So the, two P, the three PT events, we had a, a seven to eight mile run through Balboa Park, which is a beautiful park there in San Diego um, by the zoo. Uh, I didn't get to do it. I had to do some, I had some admin thing that I had to, uh, an appointment for. So I, I was very sad that I missed out on that, but it, it is what it is. And then we had two uh, calisthenic PT events. So we had uh, Admiral Smith, whose son was in our class, uh, who was notorious for just crushing, you know, third phase bud students uh, before graduation when he was the admiral of Warcom. And, uh, you know, he would do like thousands of flutter kicks until guys just couldn't, you know, you're in the best shape of your life. But he would make these exercises and he would practice these exercises that most people couldn't do too many of because they're just not used to doing them. And so he would just practice crushing you know he would take pleasure in like crushing these bud students who are in the best shape of their life uh with like push-ups or flutter kicks or other weird dive bomber push-ups or or anything like that so uh there was a pt with him and then there was also a, a and also a pt with uh master chief denny chalker who was a plank owner of one of the a seal team on the east coast i won't use any numbers just because i shouldn't um and then and then we graduated uh some of us re-enlisted and then from there we went to either jump school to army jump school to learn how to fall down for three weeks because that's really all jump school is until you get to you know get five jumps out of a out of an airplane um or to sdv school or and then some guys the the guys that were part of the medic program they went to the army 18 delta course so uh that was really so that was that kind of concludes my third phase uh and bud's graduation my in in the next episode again i'll i will go over hell week 
uh, and, and kind of talk about that. But just to kind of finalize this uh, episode, just to go over some lessons learned um, that I had that, that we kind of discussed in this episode is the first, there, there's always going to be a challenge in front of you. And as long as you embrace that challenge as opportunity and you stay hungry and you, uh, you immerse yourself in that mentality, uh, no matter what obstacle you have in front of you, you will be unstoppable because you look at obstacles as opportunity. Um, the second lesson is, you know, the staff at Buds, they're always evaluating you to see if you're someone that they would be proud to serve with in a SEAL team. So one, they're looking for your grit, but they're also looking for your, uh, your, your grit, your attention to detail and your integrity. Are you someone who they trust, someone who they're going to trust when they get to the SEAL teams? Or are you going to be someone that is not safe? You don't have attention to detail. So, you know, again, Buds is a selection course, it's a selection process, and they're looking for people who they want to be on their team. And then the third lesson that I'll cover here is if you take care of your gear, you'll take care of yourself. And again, the saying in the SEAL teams is you take care of team gear first, personal gear second, and you take care of yourself last after everything else is taken care of. That is it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you guys have questions for me, please, uh, let Zach know, uh, put them in comments. I don't know if there's like a comment section somewhere so that I can answer these questions that you guys might have. But anyway, you guys stay awesome. Don't forget to get naked and I'll talk to you soon.